It is time for another tour through the atmosphere. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, proudly coming up on our 24th year of weekly service to the amateur radio community all around the world. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1242 of This Week in Amateur Radio. New section managers are appointed and incumbent section managers will continue new terms all beginning in April 2023. The deadline for the 2023 AWRL Foundation Scholarship Program is coming up on January 4th, 2023. NASA has determined that a micrometeoroid hit is suspected after a major coolant leak from the Soyuz capsule is vented into space. We will have all the details. Amateur Radio helps rescue a lost hiker in New Hampshire. A vintage Gate BC-1T commercial broadcast transmitter contributes to the amateur bands to the transatlantic tests. SAQ, the Alexanderson alternator at Grimeton Station, will transmit a special Christmas Eve message. And a documentary simply entitled Ham is presented on Montana Public Television. We will tell you all about it and how you can see it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll get a report from Bruce Page, KK5DO, and an update from AMSAT, and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us everything you need to know about routers and what he calls internet background radiation. And we will hear all about his love of old-fashioned keyboards. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will present a segment he calls Morris is Dead, Long Live Morris, as Anno believes he has invented a new way to learn Morris code. Our own amateur radio historian Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to November 15, 1945. That's the date amateurs are allowed back on the air at least on a portion of the amateur bands, and that was also the first year of our brand new 50 to 54 megacycle 6 meter band, and it was amateurs' first encounter with TVI, television interference. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, keeps his feet on the ground again this week as he presents part three of his series called On the Rails, using your radios while taking a trip aboard a train. We will have our fourth Christmas segment this week, hosted by Bill Continelli, W2XOY. You're going to want to stay tuned for that. And we will have a special interview with Kay Savitz, K6KJN, the Internet Archives Program Manager of Special Collections and Curator of the Internet Archives' new Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications. That and a lot more is all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, this Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we have yet survived another edition of Snowmageddon, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Reporting live in my basement in Glenmont, New York, just outside the capital of Albany, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, where winter does seem to have finally arrived, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're still staying out of six inches of heavy wet snow, and the dipole antenna needs a little work because of that. I'm Don Ulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from a snowy Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're being told that we have a 30% chance of a white Christmas this year, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. It's gonna be interesting. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, new section managers have been appointed, and incumbent section managers will continue new terms in April of 2023. With more details, we go to John Ross, who files this report from League Headquarters. 
Betsy Doan, K1EIC, has been appointed by ARRL headquarters as the Connecticut section manager as of November 23, 2022, to fulfill a role on a limited basis while the search continues for a full-time section manager. Doan was previously the Connecticut section manager for 25 years from 1991 to 2016. Chuck Motes, K1DFS, has served as ARRL Connecticut section manager for the last six years. He decided not to run for a new term of office when his third term concluded on September 30th, 2022. Ralph Fettig, N0RDF, will become the ARRL North Dakota section manager on January 1st, 2023. Fettig was the only nominee to submit a petition to run for office when the resolicited nomination period closed on December 9th, 2022. As the sole nominee, he has been declared elected. Although his elected 18-month term of office starts on April 1, 2023, Fettig has been officially appointed by ARRL Field Service Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, to start early on New Year's Day. Charles O'Neill, KE4AIE, has been appointed to the ARRL Kentucky Section Manager starting January 1, 2023. And although O'Neill's elected two-year term of office officially begins on April 1, 2023, he was also appointed to start on New Year's Day because the position has been open for the past few months. And you can read more about elections and appointments at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. North Dakota Section Manager Richard Budd, W0TF of York, decided not to run for another two-year term of office that began on October 1st. Budd, however, voluntarily extended his service as Section Manager until a new Section Manager could be installed. Kentucky Section Manager Steve Morgan, W4NHO, decided to step down this past July before the current term of office concludes on March 31, 2023. Morgan of Owensboro has served as Section Manager since 2017. He has been serving simultaneously as the section traffic manager and affiliated club coordinator. Morgan was also the ARRL Kentucky section manager from 1991 to 1997. For the winter season section manager election cycle, there will not be balloted elections. The following incumbent ARRL section managers ran unopposed, and they've been declared re-elected and will begin their new two-year terms of office on April 1, 2023. Rick Paquette, W7RAP, representing Arizona. James Ferguson, N5LKE of Arkansas, Lilia Garner, WA0UIG in Iowa, Malcolm Cohn, W5XX from Mississippi, Stephen Lott Smith, KG5VK in North Texas, Bob Turner, W6RHK representing Orange, and Garth Crow, WY7GC from Wyoming. There were no section manager nominees from Montana for the next term of office. ARRL Montana Section Manager Paul Stiles, KF7SOJ of Billings, decided not to run for a new term of office. Since no nominations from Montana were submitted, a resolicitation for nominees will appear in the April and May 2023 issues of QST. The application deadline for the 2023 ARRL Foundation Scholarship Program is January 4, 2023 at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. With more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. More than 100 scholarships, ranging from $500 to $25,000, will be awarded in 2023 to radio amateurs who are pursuing higher education. While the terms of each scholarship may vary, many of the awards may be applied to tuition, books, fees, and other educational expenses. Applicants must be active FCC licensed amateur radio operators. Active foreign amateur radio operators are eligible for scholarships established by Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, and are administered by the ARRL Foundation. Every applicant must submit a completed online application by the deadline. The ARRL Foundation will be utilizing the same scholarship management platform for 2023 scholarships as it used for 2022 scholarships. Transcripts and additional required documents must be submitted with the online application and not emailed separately. Some scholarships require additional documents, such as a letter of recommendation from a sitting officer of an ARRL-affiliated club. Applications without accompanying transcripts and additional required documents will not be considered. In 2022, there were 139 foundation scholarships awarded, totaling $921,250. Additional information and a link to the application can be found at www.arl.org slash scholarships dash program. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The ARRL Foundation Scholarship Committee will review all applications for eligibility and award decisions. 
Recipients will be notified in May 2023 via USPS and email. Awards are mailed directly to the recipient's schools. The ARRL Foundation administers programs to support the amateur radio community and was established in 1973 by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. That all-important address once again for additional information and a link to the application can be found at www.arrl.org forward slash scholarship hyphen program. A major leak from a Russian capsule docked on the International Space Station was most probably caused when a small meteoroid smashed into a radiator, leading to coolant being sprayed into space, a Roscosmos official has said. Sergei Krikalev, a former cosmonaut who is now director of crewed space flight programs at Russia's Space Corporation, said Thursday's leak from the Soyuz MS-22 could affect the capsule's overall coolant system, but that there was no threat for the crew of the space station. The leak had prompted a pair of cosmonauts to abort a planned spacewalk earlier in the day. It also raises concern over the capsule's capability of returning safely to Earth next spring as planned with two cosmonauts and a NASA astronaut, or whether an emergency replacement vehicle will have to be sent up. Micrometeoroids, naturally occurring pieces of rock or metal that can be as small as a grain of sand, pose a significant danger to human spaceflight. They hurl around the Earth at about 27,400 kilometers per hour, much faster than the speed of a bullet. Human-made space junk can also damage equipment. Last year, Russia blew up one of its own satellites in a missile test that created clouds of zooming shrapnel. On Thursday, a visible stream of flakes prompted Russian flight controllers to abort the spacewalk, a NASA live stream showed. Tonight's spacewalk has been canceled because of an observed leak of what is believed to be a cooling substance from the Soyuz MS-22, the NASA commentator Rob Navius can be heard saying in a broadcast from NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. We noticed a visible stream of flakes coming from the aft of the Soyuz near the instrumentation and propulsion module that was indicative of a leak, Navius added. The mishap occurred just before two of the Roscosmos cosmonauts, crew commander Sergei Prokopiev and flight engineer Dmitry Petland, suited up for a planned spacewalk to move a radiator from one module to another on the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Earlier, an official for Russia's mission control operations near Moscow was heard telling the pair in a radio transmission that their spacewalk was being cancelled while engineers worked to determine the nature of the problem. NASA also said the ISS crew was not thought to be in any danger from the leak. The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee has released the 2023-2027 to General Class FCC Element 3 Syllabus and Question Pool to the public. With more details, we go to John Ross, who files this report from League Headquarters. The new general question pool is effective July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2027. And that new pool incorporates some significant changes compared to the last version. Its 432 questions were modified slightly to improve wording and to replace distractors. 51 new questions were generated and 73 questions were eliminated. This resulted in a reduction of 22 questions, bringing the total number of questions in the pool down from 454. The level of difficulty of questions is more balanced and the techniques and practices addressed have been updated. The pool is available as a Microsoft Word document and PDF. The single graphic required for the new general question pool is available within the documents or separately as a PDF and JPEG files. The newly revised pool must be used for general class license exams starting July 1, 2023, said ARRL VEC manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, who is a member of the question pool committee. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. New test designs will be available to the ARRL volunteer examiners on that date. The ARRL VEC will supply its officially appointed, field-stocked volunteer examiner teams with the new general exam booklet designs around mid-June. 
general class examination candidates preparing for their exams using the ninth edition of the general class license manual and or the sixth edition of the AWRL's general Q&A are encouraged to test by or before June 30th, 2023. New editions of ARRL licensing publications will be available in May for exams taken on or after July 1st, 2023. This note before we begin the story. The following event took place on Sunday afternoon, December 11th, 2022, and was composed by Raul Skip Camejo, AC1LC, Public Information Coordinator for the ARRL New Hampshire section. A New Hampshire man and his dog went out for a day hike yesterday in the Belmont area of central New Hampshire. Things went well until his cell phone battery died, and with darkness near and a prediction of snow, a leisurely day hike was quickly turning into a serious health and safety issue. Fortunately for him, he's also an amateur radio operator and brought along his digital mobile radio, or DMR, handheld. With no cell phone capability, he made a call on DMR New Hampshire statewide channel through the Gunstock Mountain DMR repeater looking for assistance. His call was answered by Bill Barber, NE1B, who was monitoring the channel. The hiker asked Barber to call his wife because he couldn't text or get pinged with his dead cell phone. Barber contacted the hiker's wife and she was glad to hear that someone was in contact with him. Unfortunately, he didn't know exactly where he was. He believed he'd have to walk through brush for an hour or more just to get to a road. His wife called the local police department and began to search with their fire department. Amateur radio is the only communications from about 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Barbara was able to make contact with Rick Zack, K1RJZ, who lives close to the search area, and was familiar with the area's snowmobile trails. Zack coordinated communications between the responding police units and the lost radio operator and the New Hampshire statewide talk group. Police and fire units attempted to assist in the search by activating their sirens in different locations, trying to obtain a location on the ham operator, but he wasn't able to hear them. Another amateur radio operator, Chuck Cunningham, K1MIZ was monitoring the events on the net watch and noticed that the lost ham had accidentally changed channels. This information was passed along and two meter DMR communication continued until the lost ham walked out to a road and was able to advise searchers of his location. The search and checkout ended successfully at 6 30 p.m. Thanks to the efforts of Bill Barber, NE1B, Rick Zack, K1RJZ, and Chuck Cunningham, K1MIZ. Barbara listed some very important lessons learned from the incident. Radio batteries last longer on DMR radios than in the analog mode. Even his wife had trouble with her cell phone coverage at home. And monitor your local state DMR channels to help others nearby. You may wish to program in 146.520 FM next to your state channel for signal strength direction for finding and what you're out in the repeater range. Some hams still monitor 146.520 MHz simplex. Stay on the primary channel till you know that more hams are nearby to directly find your signal. And hike with DMR network sites cover many areas of New England that don't have any cell service at all. Always hike with a flashlight. And as he went on, I'd like to add one more item to the list. My son is one of the leaders of the Pemigawasset Valley, New Hampshire, search and rescue team. And unfortunately, he responds to too many calls for lost hikers. One very important item that he stresses is that hikers file a flight plan. Let somebody who is not going on the hike know where you're going how long you expect to be gone, and what communications equipment or capability you have with you. This also applies if you're going out hunting, fishing, or boating. Listeners around the world tune in regularly to WWV and WWVH, the radio station of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, for various voice announcements, including the time. Now the United States government agency hopes qualified engineers will tune into an important job opening it has for an engineering position based in Hawaii. Radio station WWVH, which is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is looking to hire an engineer in charge. In addition to maintenance of the station on Kauai, Hawaii, the job requires regular communication with the NIST's Time and Frequency Division in Boulder, Colorado. The engineer is responsible for the four radio transmission systems on 2.5, 5, 10, and 15 megahertz, which are required to be on the air 99.7% of the time. 
one or two electronic technicians will report to the engineer in charge. For more details about the job and whether you qualify, visit www.usajobs.gov. Again, that's www.usajobs.gov. Visitors to the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut were part of a celebration of history taking place on Sunday, December 11th. They watched and heard as Bob Allison, WB1GCM, got on the air using a repurposed Gates BC1T commercial transmitter using the call sign W1VCM slash 1BCG for AM operation on 75 meters. Bob was marking the 101st anniversary of amateur station 1BCG's contact with Scotland during the ARRL transatlantic test of 1921. Bob, president of the museum's amateur radio club, said, December 11th is a great day to celebrate amateur radio as the day marks the many technological successes of the era. CW's efficiency and effectiveness over Spark, the use of a super heterodyne radio receiver, and the directional beverage antenna. The tribute event had been organized by Clark Burgard, N1BCG of Greenwich, Connecticut. The original transmissions that made history more than a century ago occurred in Greenwich about 90 minutes southwest of the museum, with operators sending CW across the ocean. This year, more modern equipment joined the refurbished Gates transmitter during Bob's three-hour activation, which also included time spent on 40 meters and 2 meter sideband. Before he left for the day and headed out into the snow, Bob made sure he logged one more important contact. Bob talked to the museum visitors who'd been observing him on the radio to share in the triumph of more than a century ago. On Christmas Eve morning, December 24th, 2022, the Alexander Grimmiton Friendship Association in southern Sweden will be on the air sending out a special Christmas message to the world. The event will begin at 0830 CET, that's 0730 UTC, with the startup and tuning of the Alexanderton alternator transmitter through the Grimmerton radio station, call sign SAQ. The transmission will begin at 0900 CET or 0800 UTC with a 98 year old 200 kilowatt Alexanderson alternator on 17.2 kilohertz CW. Grimmerton radio station SK6 SAQ will be the QRV on the following frequencies. 3.535 MHz CW, 7.035 MHz CW, 14.035 MHz CW, 3.755 MHz SSB, and 7.140 MHz SSB. QSL reports can be sent to SK6SAQ via email at info at alexander.n.se. The event will also be live streamed on the Alexander SAQ Grimmerton Friendship Association YouTube channel. The Alexanderson alternator transmitter is the only remaining example of an early pre-electronic radio transmitter technology. The station, built in 1922 through 1924, has been preserved as a historical site. From the 1920s through the 1940s, it was used to transmit telegram traffic by Morse code to North America and throughout the world during World War II. More information about the December 24th Christmas Eve event and the transmitter can be found at the Grimmerton Radio Station website. Ten Nevada County Amateur Radio Emergency Service members were sworn in as Nevada County Office of Emergency Services Disaster Service Worker Volunteers during their December 1st, 2022 meeting at the Nevada County Airport in California. Lieutenant Sean Scales, Nevada County Safety Officer, Emergency Operations Coordinator, and Office of Emergency Services administered the oath. Nevada County Amateur Radio Emergency Service, Nevada County Office of Emergency Services, signed a Memorandum of Understanding in May to establish the cooperative relationship. Nevada County Amateur Radio Aries volunteers are another local resource Nevada County Officer of Emergency Services can call upon to support our community, said Lieutenant Scales. Peter Mason, N6ERL, Nevada County Aries Emergency Coordinator, added, 
Ares members use their radio equipment and training to provide radio communication support to local agencies during emergencies, including Nevada County OES and the American Red Cross. Nevada County Ares sponsors a free educational program for local neighborhoods called Neighborhood Radio Watch. In three in-person meetings, households learn the benefits of and how to use handheld general mobile radio service radios to communicate during emergency situations when internet, phone, and cell services become unavailable or fail, said Mark Triolo, N6PVI, Nevada County Aries GMRS program leader. Aries is a program of ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. The Director General of the British Broadcasting Corporation has announced that the BBC could turn off its terrestrial radio and TV services within the next decade. Tim Davies said a switch-off of broadcasts will and should happen over time, and that the BBC should be active in planning for it. He said the corporation needed to own a move to the Internet future with greater urgency as he looked towards 2030 and beyond. In a speech to the Royal Television Society, he said, Imagine a world that is Internet only, where broadcast TV and radio are being switched off, and choice is infinite. There's still a lot of live linear viewing, but it's all been delivered online. He suggested that's a bad way to switch off could happen, where access to the BBC is no longer universal or unaffordable for too many. Where the gateway to content is owned by a well-capitalized overseas company, he added. In order to avoid this, the country must close gaps and guarantee accessibility for all, he said describing efforts by the government to improve access to fixed-line broadband and 5G or 4G as critical. The Director General also called for serious public service investment if it's to compete with international rivals in the coming years. Mr. Davies said the BBC needs more money to support its world service and to avoid further cuts. Some 382 jobs at the service, often regarded as a source of soft power for the UK, are being lost as part of a plan to move to the digital laid offering with Arabic and Persian radio services among those closing. He said plans to discuss the issue of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and warned that Russia and China are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in state-backed services. We have a choice to make, he added. The BBC has said that due to a freeze in the license fee and inflation, it faces a £400 million funding gap by 2026 and 2027, and must make savings. He and Mr. Davies said UK media are in a period of real jeopardy with a life-threatening challenge to the local media and the cultural and social benefits they provide. The threat is not about if there's a choice, it's about the scope of future choices and the future factors that shape it, he added. During the speech, Davy prescribed a blueprint for what the media market was the next decade could look at. He said, as we look towards the 2030s, we're open-minded about the future of funding mechanics. But as we're clear, that's critical. We'll need a universal solution that fuels UK public service growth, not stifles it, while offering audiences outstanding value. Of course, the latest settlement did include the increased debt facility for BBC Studios, which was welcome. Alongside commercial plans, they'll keep cutting costs to invest and attract more partner investment, as well as the latest deal that they announced with Disney on Doctor Who. But under the most ambitious scenarios, it will not change the need for serious public service investment. Earlier this year, former Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries announced a license fee would be frozen at £159 for the next two years. She said she wanted to find new funding models for the current deal expires in 2027, as it's completely outdated. The new minister, Michelle Donnellan, said this week it was impossible to sustain the BBC on its current finance fee model, confirming she plans to continue the government's review into the annual charge. Mr. Davies said the BBC politicians, regulators, and wider industry must work together to leave a legacy of a thriving world leading UK media market or accept on our watch a slow decline. Routers, it's a question that I get asked a lot. What's the best router? And it's kind of like saying, what's the best computer? I mean, there isn't a best computer. Uh, there's a best computer for you. There's a best router for you. But it's for you. And so there's no blanket. I can't say uh, with a blanket recommendation that, oh, well, everyone should just get this and be done with it. I wish I could. That would be a lot easier. But really, as always, you kind of have to ask some questions about how you're going to use it 
you know, what your issues are, why you why you want a new router, what Wi-Fi issues you have. There are a couple of basic things you must have, in my opinion, uh, in a router. And if your router doesn't currently have this, you should get a new router probably. And at least if you're getting a new router, you should make sure that your new router has a few features. Number one on the list is over-the-air firmware upgrades. And I know that maybe that's a that's a little confusing phrase, but you already have that on your phone, right? Your phone automatically updates. You have it on your laptop, on your desktop. Your computer automatically updates. Sometimes it'll say uh, the phone usually does. Hey, I've got updates. Do you want to update now? And you say yes, but th and that's fine. But you want these updates pushed to you automatically. Most routers, until recently. You just never updated it, and if if you were having problems, you, it's like the BIOS updates on older computers, which, by the way, are also now over the air automated. And in the old days, you'd say, "Oh, let me see if there's any update to the firmware on the router." Huh. No, you can't do that anymore because routers are the first thing, the one thing that you have sitting on the public internet. That means they're the bearing the brunt of all the internet attacks. There's constant attacks going on against these routers. Yes, your router. Because things like WannaCry, you know, that's the ransomware. Uh, these are called network worms because once they're on a machine, then they go out and try to infect other machines. And they become part of what my friend Steve Gibson calls internet background radiation. It's just constantly going on. There's a virus out there that was, we believe, created by the Russians. Uh, we're not sure why. We think maybe they're trying to use it to for cyber warfare. It's called VPN filter. You remember the, a couple of months ago, the FBI said everybody should reboot their routers. <laughs> That's because this, uh, this malware VPN filter lived in the memory of your router. And if you turned it off, you know, unplugged it and plugged it in again, it would clear it out of the memory. It wasn't exactly the right advice the FBI gave because it turned out that they could still get reinfected even if you rebooted it. Really, the only real fix for this kind of stuff is a firmware upgrade. That the So it requires you to buy a router from, A, a manufacturer that's going to keep tabs on that software and update it regularly, and B, push it out to you because you can't be expected to go out and check. It's not your job. You, the router should uh, automatically update itself. And I would not buy, these days, I would not buy a router that doesn't. It's just, uh, it's just too darn uh, risky. In fact, I would extend that to say anything that goes on the Internet should be updated automatically. That's why Windows and Macintosh and Android and iOS are all updated automatically nowadays. It's just table stakes. It's just the base requirement. So if your router is not updating automatically, well, get one that does. And if you're buying a new router, get one that does. So that's the first question you should ask. There is a newer standard. It turns out the... You know, every router, of course, and any decent modern router will have the ability to uh, put a password on the router. And what's actually happening there is it's encrypting its traffic. It's scrambling it. It gets descrambled with the password. That's important so that somebody who's in your vicinity can't snoop on what you're doing and can't join your network. So I hope that if you have a Wi-Fi router, you've turned on password protection. In general, it should be WPA2. And that's because the original password protection built into routers, WEP, was very badly designed and has been cracked. Turns out now WPA2 is pretty vulnerable. If you, if you don't use a good password, it's not so hard to crack. So if you're using WPA2, don't use a – and I do this. I, 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 I'm going to change my ways. For a long time I thought, well, it doesn't matter how good a password I use on that. No, it does, turns out. So use a good password. Because what can happen now, with even with WPA2, is somebody, they still need to be able to see your Wi-Fi. They need to get it close enough, sit on your curb or whatever, to get a bunch of packets. But they can download those packets, then go home and run a brute force cracker on them and get your Wi-Fi password. Now, nobody's going to do that to you. Why would anybody care that much, right? So you're probably okay. But if you really want to be secure, use a long, strong password. That means it's very hard for them to brute force it. They can't crack it easily, even if they take it home and work on it for days and weeks and months. They can't get into it. If you use monkey123, they'll be into it in a couple hours. <laughs> Maybe not even that long. 
So use a good password. WPA3 does not have this vulnerability. It's been announced it will be coming. And a modern router, a router you buy today, should be WPA3 compatible if it has a fast enough processor. So those are all things to keep in mind. You would like a router that can be firmware upgraded to WPA3 if possible. That'll give you more security. But it's not the end of the world if it doesn't. WPA2 is good enough if you use a nice, long, strong password. So what else should you look for in a router? Well, there are other considerations that may or may not be important. I usually like a router that is tri-band. So you remember the early Wi-Fi routers were 802.11b. That was at the 2.4 gigahertz band. There have been new updates to that, and then we're now at 802.11ac, and it can use both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And in fact, there are two different segments of the 5 gigahertz band that it can use. So that's a tri-band router. It uses 2.4 gigahertz and high and low 5 gigahertz. Why do you want three bands? Well, because in many cases, congestion is a problem these days. Not only are you using many devices, but so is your neighbor. Your neighbor's Wi-Fi is overpowering your Wi-Fi. One of the things, one of the problems with Wi-Fi is it's a collision-based network, which means if your Wi-Fi router starts sending data and, and your neighbor's Wi-Fi router starts sending data, your router will go, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, and stop for a random amount of time before it begins again. Two different Wi-Fi routers can't talk on the same frequency at the same time. So one will stop and politely wait for the other to finish. This is probably not what you want. Probably not what you want. So my suggestion is uh, <laughs> get a, a tri-band router. You're much more likely to be able to find a frequency that isn't stepped on by your neighbor. What about those mesh routers? Well, they're very expensive, but often they work well for people who are having problems because either they have so many devices attached to their Wi-Fi or more likely because they're so spread out. One Wi-Fi unit will cover about 1,500 square feet. If you have a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot house or more, you might need a extender. And that's what mesh does particularly well. There's plume, there's velop. There's, I mean, I can go on and on and on. There are a lot of manufacturers that make these. The other advantage of those is, in every case, they are over-the-air updatable. That's one of the things Wi-Fi mesh routers do, is they constantly get updates so that they work better on your network. It's one of the reasons you pay a little more for them. But you may not need it. If you have a small area, you're not having problems with Wi-Fi, you just want you know, maybe a little better speed or a little more modern router with better security, you probably can just get a simple Wi-Fi router. Look at this thing. I have in my hands a piece of history. You know, one of the things about technology that's generally the case, uh, they called it Moore's Law, really, right? Uh, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, said that the, the – well, what he said literally was – what did he say? The density of transistors on a processor, on a chip, would double every 18 months. That's what he said. But it's often uh, translated into the power of a chip. The capabilities of a chip would double every 18 months. And that's roughly roughly the same. And if, if, you, uh, if you understand doubling every 18 months, you understand, well, it doubles, and then in three years it quadruples, and then in, uh, in uh, four and a half years, it uh, eight times eight. And because it's doubling every year and a half, you know, it doesn't take long before you get up some pretty powerful stuff. And we've seen that, haven't we? In fact, we're finally, at this point, I think, getting to the point where processors aren't getting much faster. They're not, it's, the number of transistors might be doubling, I guess, but uh, I don't think so. We get, we got the point now where there's so much density on the processor, you can't get much more dense. So in general, though, what that means is things get faster and cheaper, lower power. I mean, it's kind of a miracle. It's the miracle of the microcosm as George Gilder said, and it's what's powered Silicon Valley. And yet there are some things that don't follow that rule, physical things, like, I don't know, keyboards. Screens have gotten better, haven't they? Oh, yeah. You can't use a screen. Five-year-old, I was looking at an old uh, Apple uh, Mac, Macintosh Air, MacBook Air, and uh, that screen is uh, not a, what we call, what Apple calls a retina display. It's not a very high resolution. And you can see it's like blurry. It looks like it's a little out of focus. And then you use one of the more modern high resolution displays, PC or Mac, and you go, yeah, that's crisp. 
You watch TV now on a 4K HDR screen. It's like, wow, that looks real. So screens have gotten a lot better. But you know, there's another input device you use, another something you use every time you use a computer that has gotten worse. And I think everybody agrees they've gotten worse. Keyboards. Keyboards. And Apple's the worst. Apple's keyboards are horrible. So I did a strange thing the other day. I went to a website called clickykeyboards.com and I bought <laughs> I bought a 28-year-old keyboard. It's an IBM M series keyboard that are widely considered by keyboard connoisseurs to be among the best, not maybe the best. The predecessor to the M was the F series that some say were better, but uh they're, they have an odd layout. This is the this is the 104 key, modern keyboard layout, so that's good. For it was, I guess, for an IBM PC, right? The thing's heavy. Things like almost six pounds. It's bulky. It's a beast, and it uses this key technology uh, that is looks medieval. It's what they call a buckling spring keyboard, and so under each key. There's literally, literally a spring that as you depress it, it compresses like a spring normally would until it gets to the point where it can't compress anymore and it goes boing, it's, it's, it's jumps sideways. You've seen springs do that. You press it, press it, press it, and go boing. <laughs> well, normally that's a defect, right? But in this keyboard, that's what it's supposed to do. When it springs sideways, there's a little hip check. It closes the switch and the key is typed. A buckle, it buckles, a buckling key. Now, we've come up with... Everybody seems to think a better better system since then. You know, your most keyboards nowadays have a rubber dome that you press. This makes much more sense. I don't know who thought up this buckling key is a very strange technology. The rubber dome it makes sense. You press the key, the dome compresses like a little air bubble, and it closes the switch, and that's the keystroke. They're softer. They last a long time. You can have less travel, which is important because we're making computers thinner and thinner. But you get to the point sometimes where it gets too thin. Somebody said, I think it was Casey Johnston, she, she's, she hates the new Macintosh keyboards, that Apple's suffering from design anorexia. The, the kind of almost at this point, psychotic desire for thinness to the point where you're losing functionality. Apple's laptops are so thin, <laughs> they don't have room for the keys to move. So they had to develop a new switch. They call it the butterfly key. And a switch that just, it locks that key in place. It's very solid, very rigid. Travels about a millimeter. I think a little more, maybe a millimeter and a half. And then, boom, hits bottom, closes the switch, and you've typed the key. But it's, uh, it, for a lot of us, it's not it's not a satisfactory feeling. It doesn't move very far. It's all, I mean, you could compare that to typing on an iPad, where you're typing on glass, where there's no motion. That's even worse, right? It's hard to be accurate. You want a little feedback. You want to know that your finger is depressed a key. Something's happened. Maybe a nice solid chunk. That's for us old school types. Now, if you ever used a typewriter, it's even worse, right? A manual typewriter, you literally are flipping up a lever boom, that hits the paper, the plate, and boom, with an audible clack. These aren't quite as clacky as that, but this is the Model M key. You want to hear what a buckling? This is. This will remind you of visiting the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's that's <laughs> that's that sound. And actually, I think ergonom ergonometric folks ergo ergonomics is a study of uh, motion and uh, and in the body say that these these keyboards are better for you, less likely to cause car, what they call carpal tunnel syndrome than the... I don't know. Is that true? They're sure more satisfying. You know you hit a key. It's like a sledgehammer. Weighs like a sledgehammer, too. Maybe this is my protest against the Apple keyboards. There's another bigger problem with the Apple keyboards, which Apple's finally admitted, which is that if a crumb gets under this little tiny key, there's no way to get it out. They, <laughs> you, have, you have to pretty much replace the keyboard. And uh, guess what? It turns out a certain percentage of computer users, I don't know who would do this, eat croissants and cookies and crackers and Cheetos when they're typing. And they get under the keys quite a bit. <laughs> There's food. Yes. Who would do that? No, you should be in a clean, sterile environment washing your hands. I'm sure that's what Apple thought when they tested it. They needed to get some Cheeto users in there to test it. People eating their Fritos, Doritos. Biscoff cookies, 
Get them in there and test it. Then see what happens. Apple said, all right, all right, we'll replace your gosh darn keys or your entire keyboard if we have to. It's expensive because Apple also, when they made these special keyboards, they glued the battery to the back of them. So when you when you can't take the key caps off, it'll break them, especially the space bar. So they can't really just uh, take them apart and clean it with a compressed air as you used to do in the old days. No, they actually have to unscrew the entire computer and take the top off and replace it for seven hundred dollars. It's a lot for a fourteen hundred dollar computer. Give me buckling springs. <laughs> or, uh, I guess I, I guess I'm officially an old an old guy now. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. U.S. regulators have pushed back on SpaceX's plan to launch an additional 30,000 satellites into orbit that are needed to expand its Starlink space internet service. The Federal Communications Commission cited concerns about orbital debris and space safety, though did grant permission for Elon Musk's company to build, deploy, and operate up to 7,500 Starlink satellites. SpaceX's Starlink, a fast-growing network of more than 3,500 satellites in low-Earth orbit, has tens of thousands of users in the United States so far, with consumers paying at least $599 for a user terminal and $110 a month for service. The FCC approved the Starlink operation. SpaceX plans to deploy up to 4,425 first-generation satellites and has already launched more than 3,300. SpaceX has sought approval to operate a network of 29,988 satellites to be known as its second-generation, or Gen 2, Starlink constellation to beam Internet to areas with little or no Internet access. Our action will allow SpaceX to begin deployment of Gen 2 Starlink, which will bring next-generation satellite broadband to Americans nationwide, the FCC said in its approval order, adding it will enable worldwide satellite broadband service, helping to close the digital divide on a global scale. The FCC said its decision will protect other satellite and terrestrial operators from harmful interference and maintain a safe space environment, and protect spectrum and orbital resources for future use. In August, a U.S. appeals court upheld the 2021 decision of the FCC to approve a SpaceX plan to deploy some Starlink satellites at a lower Earth orbit than planned as part of its push to offer space-based broadband internet. In September, SpaceX challenged the FCC decision to deny it $885.5 million in rural broadband subsidies. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said in August, Starlink's technology has real promise, but that it could not meet the program's requirements, citing data that showed a steady decline in speeds over the past year and casting the service's price as too steep for consumers. NASA has also raised concerns about space safety surrounding SpaceX's Starlink constellation. In a five-page letter submitted to the FCC earlier this year, the U.S. Space Agency warned of the potential for a significant increase in the frequency of conjunction events and possible impacts to NASA's science and human spaceflight missions. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. November 15th, 1945. The day that amateurs had waited for ever since December 7th, 1941. Finally, after three years and 11 months of wartime radio silence, amateurs were allowed back on the air. Granted, we didn't have everything back yet. The initial authorization allowed amateur operations on 10 meters from 28 through 29.7 megacycles, 5 meters from 56 to 60 megacycles, and the new 2 meter band at 144 through 148 megacycles. And there were restrictions on these limited frequencies. Our old pre-war 5-meter allocation was temporary. The new post-war band was shifted to 6 meters from 50 to 54 megacycles, but the actual transition would not take place until March 1, 1946. So, we were back on the 56 to 60 megacycle segment for only three and a half months. On the new 2-meter band, the frequencies from 146.5 through 148 megacycles were unavailable within a 50-mile radius of Washington, D.C. and Seattle, Washington. The military was still using these frequencies, as well as our 160, 80, 40, and 20-meter HF bands. The military also occupied our new UHF and microwave allocations. It would be months, maybe a year or more, before the armed forces would fully vacate our bands and return them to us. But amateurs didn't care. 
Unlike 1919, when there was open hostility to us by the military and the threat of our elimination, the post-World War II armed forces, as well as the FCC, were fully aware of the tremendous assistance that amateurs had given throughout the war, and they were eager to give us back our frequencies. The ARRL was working closely with the FCC and the military to get our bands back. One band, however, was apparently not coming back. Our 160-meter band, the birthplace of our post-1912 operations, was fully occupied by the military with its new Loran radio navigation system. The armed services and the FCC made it clear that this segment was to remain for the use of Loran. Over the years, the FCC obtained small concessions, a 25 kilocycle segment here and there, 25 watt power limitations, day and night restrictions, but from the 1940s right up until the early 1980s, our 160 meter band sounded like a huge broad banded buzzsaw as Loran completely dominated it. But this was a minor blot on the landscape as amateurs rushed to get back on the air. 10 meters was the band they went to first, and the 28 through 29.7 megacycle range became crowded with those making up for lost time. Two meters was next. Hams modified their old two and a half meter equipment to operate on the new band, and soon the rushing sounds of the super regenerative receiver were everywhere. The more adventurous were trying out something called FM. Five meters was quiet. Since the band was available for only 105 days, many hams spent that time converting their rigs to the new six meter band. On March 1st, 1946, our old 5-meter band died, and the new 50-54 to 54 megacycle segment was born. Also on that date, to compensate the amateurs for the loss of 29.7 to 30 megacycles, we were given an 11-meter band at 27 megacycles. That's right, the present-day CB band was once an amateur allocation. By May 1946, we had our 80 and 75 meter allocations back. We also had a temporary allocation from 235 to 240 megacycles, which would soon be shifted down to 220 to 225 megacycles. On November 2nd, 1946, the FCC finally released our 40 and 20 meter bands. By the end of 1946, we had our full HF spectrum back, 80 and 75 meters, 40 meters, which was CW only, 20, 11, and 10 meters. Note that there was no 15 meter allocation then. Our 15 meter band did not appear until 1952. The military restrictions on our two meter band were lifted in June of 1947, and except for 160 meters, the military was off of our bands. By 1947, every amateur band from 80 through two meters was full of stations. But there was trouble brewing. Amateurs weren't the only ones taken to the airwaves. Television was growing by leaps and bounds. In 1946, there were only 7,000 TV sets. In 1947, the number jumped to 180,000. And by 1948, there were over 1 million TVs in use. Amateurs who were used to harmonically related bands and an empty VHF spectrum were not prepared for the TVI their neighbors were experiencing. A typical unshielded amateur transmitter operating on 14, 28, or 50 megacycles could wipe out all the TVs in the neighborhood. QST ran a series of articles on proper shielding and filtering of stations, and hams gradually learned to eliminate harmonics from their transmitters. But there was one band where shielding and good design didn't seem to help. Six meters. Our 50 to 54 megacycle segment was sandwiched right between TV channel 1, from 44 to 50 megacycles, and TV Channel 2 from 54 to 60. At that time, only Channel 2 was actually being used for TV. The Channel 1 range was still part of the old pre-war FM band from 42 to 50 megacycles, which was being phased out in favor of the new 88 through 108 megacycle allocation. We were causing interference to WCBS and other handful of stations on Channel 2, and the problem would only get worse when Channel 1 became available. Tests were run and an interesting solution was proposed. Because a television video signal is amplitude modulated, operates with a wide bandwidth, and uses the lower portion of the TV channel, it was determined that Channel 2 was twice as susceptible to interference from a 6-meter station than Channel 1 was. The ARRL's proposal to the FCC? Eliminate Channel 2, 
keep Channel 1. But this idea didn't sit well with the stations already on Channel 2, nor did it win the approval of Major Armstrong, who was still fighting the grand battle to keep FM broadcasting in the 42 to 50 megacycle range. And so, in August 1947, the FCC withdrew Channel 1 from the TV allocations. By the end of 1947, all the pre-war FM broadcast stations had disappeared from the 42 to 50 megacycle range, which was then turned over to public service. Amateurs learned to operate in the lower portions of 6 meters to avoid TVI to Channel 2. In our next installment, we are going to look at a major upheaval that began 40 years ago and pitted amateur against amateur and, according to some, the ARRL against hams. I'm talking about incentive licensing and how it changed the entire licensing structure. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. And now, an exclusive from this week in amateur radio. In the spirit of the holidays, we present A Ham's Night Before Christmas. Yet another corruption of Clement Clark Moore's classic Christmas tale, this time distorted by Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, and the Raleigh Amateur Radio Society, Raleigh, North Carolina. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through two meters, not a signal was keying up any repeaters. The antennas reached up from the tower quite high to catch the weak signals that bounced from the sky. The children, Tech Pluses, took their HTs to bed and dreamed of the day they'd be extras instead. Mom put on her headphones, I plugged in the key, and we tuned 40 meters for that rare ZK-3. When the meter was pegged by a signal with power, it smoked a small diode, and I swear shook the tower. Mom yanked off her phones, and with all she could muster, logged a spot of the signal on the DX packet cluster. While I ran to the window and peered up at the sky to see what could generate RF that high. It was way in the distance, but the moon made it gleam, a flying sleigh with an eight-element beam, and a little old driver who looked slightly mean, so I thought for a moment that it might be Wayne Green. But no, it was Santa, the Santa of hams, on a mission this Christmas to clean up the bands. He circled the tower, then stopped in his track, and he slid down the coax right into the shack. While Mom and I hid behind the stacks of CQ, the Santa of Hamming knew just what to do. He cleared off the shack desk of paper and parts and filled out all my late QSLs for a start. He ran copper braid, took a steel rod and pounded it into the earth till the station was grounded. He tightened loose fittings, resoldered connections, cranked down modulation, installed lightning protection. He neutralized tubes in my linear amp. Never worked right before. Now it works like a champ. A new low-pass filter cleaned up the TV. He corrected the settings in my TNC. He repaired the computer that would not compute, and he backed up the hard drive and got it to boot. Then he reached really deep in that bag that he brought, and he pulled out a big box. A new rig, I thought? A new Kenwood? An ICOM? A Yesu for me? If he thought I'd been bad, it might be QRP. Yes! The ultimate station! How could I deserve this? Could it be all those hours that I worked public service? He hooked it all up, and in record time quickly worked 100 countries, all down on 160. I should have been happy it was my call he sent, but the cards and the postage would cost two months' rent. He made final adjustments and left a card by the key to Gary from Santa Claus, 73. Then he grabbed his HT, looked me straight in the eye, punched a code on the pad, and was gone. No goodbye. I ran back to the station, and the pile-up was big, but a card from St. Nick would be worth my new rig. Oh, too late, for his final came over the air, 
It was copied all over. It was heard everywhere. The ham Santa exclaimed, What a ham might expect. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, good DX. The preceding was copyrighted 1996 by Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. Happy Holidays. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the oldest means of electronic messaging is Morse code. Developed by Alfred Vail and Samuel Morse and sent for the first time on the 24th of May 1844, Morse code changed the way we communicate. For nearly a century it was required to become a licensed radio amateur, until in 2003 the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, left it to the discretion of individual countries to decide if a budding amateur needed to demonstrate their ability to send and receive in Morse. With that decision, many thought that the end of Morse code was only a matter of time. They were wrong. Turns out that the use and progress of Morse code continues at a surprising rate. Searching for scholarly articles on the subject, you'll discover that it's used for communication by quadriplegics, for information exchange between IoT or Internet of Thing devices, as a way to secure information combining DNA and Morse code, as a method for gesture recognition, as a research tool for psychologists interested in learning methodologies, for training neural nets, for REM sleep research, and plenty more. Learning the code is an activity that sparks joy, or dread, depending on whom you ask. For me, it's been a decade of anticipation with little to show for it. How to learn is a question that prompts as many answers as there are people within earshot, and most of those disagree with each other. If you do ask, you'll discover that there are dozens of websites that offer to teach you. Podcasts and audio files, bits of paper, buzzers, software and video, images and cheat sheets, the list is endless. You'll also discover two terms, Koch and Farnsworth. Both are intended means of learning. You'll find proponents of both methods wherever you look. You'll also hear from people who learnt the army way, whatever that means. There's people who were taught not to send before they could properly receive, those who were taught the opposite, and everything in between. There's discussion on the topic, heated even, but very little in the way of actual hard data. There's some research. In 1990, the Keller method from World War II was explored. The method involves playing a Morse letter followed by a gap, where the student is expected to write the letter, followed by a voice prompt of the letter. Interesting, were it not for the fact that it looked at nine students, and only at their ability to master the alphabet. In 1960, 310 airmen were subjected to 14 tests to determine their ability to learn Morse. No idea what the research outcomes were since the Journal of Applied Psychology doesn't appear to share their research unless you pay for it. There are reports of actual science behind the Koch method of learning, but I wasn't able to find it, though it's repeated often. It's only with the introduction of computers that actually using this method of learning has become practicable and recently popular. As you might know, I've been attempting to learn Morse code for a while now. I've tried many different things, including Farnsworth, Koch and others. I publish versions of my podcast as Morse code audio only. They're published every week and there are a few people who listen. I also attempted to make stereo audio files with a computer-generated voice in one ear and a Morse word in the other. I generated flashcards, I tried learning the coders dits and dars, but in the end nothing really worked for me. About a month ago I came across a video on YouTube by Electronic Notes. It contained the Morse alphabet as audio and flashed the letter visually on the screen whilst the audio was playing. There's also a video with numbers and a combination of the two. It gave me the idea for something entirely different to try, and in preparing to talk about this, it turns out there's even research to suggest that I might be onto something. I discovered that in 1994, 60 healthy people were tested to determine if learning Morse code in a rehabilitation setting was best achieved using visual, auditory, or a combination of both. The research conclusion was that the combination works best. My idea is a video that shows an individual word whilst Morse code for that word is heard. 
There's no dits and dars on the screen, just the word, written in English, and the Morse code for that word. The speed is 25 words per minute, or WPM, and it's played with a side tone of 600 Hz. Each video is an entire podcast, lasts about 30 minutes, and plays at full speed. I'm already beginning to notice that some words sound like a sound blob in much the same way as when I learnt a new language, so I'm hopeful that this will finally get me on my way. It's early days and the video channel is an experiment, so please comment to share your thoughts on the experience. Who knows, I might have introduced a new way to learn. Now all we need is some research to compare it to other methods. Koch, Keller, Farnsworth and Ono. Hi hi. You'll be able to find this article on YouTube too. Morse is dead. Long live Morse. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY. When I found out that Archive had this new project they were working on, the Digital Library of Amateur Radio, I'm just like, this sounds perfect for me because I know how to use the tools. I am very interested in ham radio. And honestly, I love the Internet Archive. It seemed like a dream job. The thoughts of Kay Sabbats. K6, KJN, Internet Archives Program Manager, Special Collections. Rains Hap Holly, KC9RP, spoke with this new addition to the Internet Archive. This is a project of the Internet Archive, which is a nonprofit online library, which has been around for more than 25 years. The Internet Archive is probably best known for the Wayback Machine, which is a tool that lets you see websites that don't exist anymore or websites, what they used to say or what they used to look like. But the Internet Archive is much more than that. It's an online digital library that has more than 100 petabytes of information of all sorts. They got a grant from ARDC, the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Foundation that supports ham radio activities all around the world. They give grants to further the aspect of ham radio. So Internet Archive got a grant from ARDC to create the ultimate online library all related to amateur radio, shortwave radio, and other aspects of radio communication. The Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications is a new project, only a couple of months old. I am the person who is curating the library. What motivated you to get into the archiving business? That's an interesting question, Hap. I have been archiving things for many years. One of my hobbies is old 8-bit Atari computers, and I have been interviewing people and archiving software and other information about these old computers for many years. And in doing that, I learned how to do it. I learned how to find people, how to use the Internet Archive and upload lots and lots of information. How do you determine what you're going to archive? The history of ham radio, as you know, as a hobby, is more than 100 years old. And there's so many aspects to it that it's hard to say no to anything. I have a very long leash. People have offered me books and magazines to put online, podcasts and YouTube video channels and talks from ham radio conferences, recorded talks, call books and manuals. It's all fair game. Pretty much the only time I say no is if we already have something. The Internet Archive has high speed scanners that can scan books in very little time without harming the books. Say you have a shelf full of ham radio books that you don't need anymore, you can donate them to Internet Archive. They are shipped to our scanning center in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where they are, are scanned and then kept by the Internet Archive. And then the digital versions of those books go online. And it works like a library. If, if we have one copy of a book, then we make one copy available online. And if we have two copies, then two people can read it you know, simultaneously. You check it out to read on in your web browser, just like a traditional public library works. In answer to your question, how do I choose if it's a book that we don't have yet and it's about ham radio or shortwave or even CB and it seems interesting, I'll accept it and we'll get it put online. How are you funded? The ARDC Foundation, it's a private foundation, and they gave a significant grant to fund this project. How much audio do you have in your library? That's a really great question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. First of all, your 
rain reports. As we speak, they are uploading and I'm uploading the episodes from 2004 to 2019. And that is about 800 episodes. So we haven't even gotten into the 90s and early 2000s. So I'm sure you have more than a thousand episodes. So how much audio do we have? We have a lot of podcasts. I've been working on getting a lot of podcasts, um, some of which are still being produced and some of which are out of print, as you were, kind of legacy podcasts. So far, I've uploaded maybe not including your stuff, maybe 2000 episodes and maybe they're an hour each. So that's a lot of audio. Most of them are spoken word in English. Some are in other languages. Some of the podcasts are in Morse code. If you want to practice your receiving code, there are entire podcasts that are nothing but dits and dahs for you to listen to. I know that you have QSO today, Eric Druth, for that one UG's archives and those are over 400 hour podcasts. Right. And there's uh, Foundations of Amateur Radio is uh, 388 episodes. What about Newsline? I don't have Amateur Radio Newsline yet. I want to. Try to do these things and, and get permission and reach out and, and, and do these things the right way. Like I said, I've only been doing this a couple of months and I haven't talked to anybody yet. Some people I reach out to and say, hey, would you like to be included in this library? And some people like you have to reach out to me and say, hey, I have created this amazing resource and do you want to include it? And I'll say, heck yes. If I were to drop dead tomorrow, my wife wouldn't necessarily know where the archives are. And the rainreport.com website, that costs a certain amount of money and there's no point of her having to take that out of pocket if it's not being improved or added to. So that's what I thought, well, I'm 71. I don't know how much time I'll be around. Maybe I'll be around another 8, 10, 12 years, maybe 8, 10, 12 days. Who knows? No one is going to continue. And this is part of the problem is there's so much of this stuff in ham radio that is done out of personal commitment as a volunteer activity. And when we are gone, who's going to do it? Probably nobody. I completely agree. None of us are going to live forever. So it's great to be able to take anything you create and put it on a structure that's going to last longer, like Internet Archive. And then even if you do last forever, websites don't. You forget to pay the bill or you don't renew the domain name or people lose interest in the hobby and move on to other things. And this is a way to make sure that the stuff that you've created or that your listeners you know, have created, if they have their own books or podcasts or anything, lasts a long time. Some of the people I've talked to have YouTube video channels where they make ham radio related content there. And that's great. But I say to them, YouTube can take your channel down for any reason or for no reason at all. And then it's gone. Well, those people have chosen to put a backup at, at the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications. And we're not going to take your stuff down. And that reminds me to uh, remind you that there is a rain report channel on YouTube. It's only been there since... I began producing the uh, RAIN hamcast because of uh, time commitments. There's really no time to add video to mm -hmm. these audio programs. But there are a few talks that I have that actually have video attached to them because they're from the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. So I get permission for those. That expo has uh, agreed to let us mirror all of the videos that they're uploading to their YouTube no. channel as well. Who has the storage? The Internet Archive has the storage. They have more than 100 petabytes of information stored right now. They don't use the cloud. They don't use other services. They host it all themselves and back it up all themselves. Their main server is in San Francisco. They have a, an amazing office there in a, a building that, that used to be a church. And all the servers are in the back of the main church room <laughs> near the pipe organ. 100 petabytes last time I, I was I was told the number. How many terabytes is that? It's a thousand terabytes in a petabyte. It's a lot of storage. How far back do your archives go? And what are some of the archives that have gotten more readership or listenership than others. One of the very first things that someone donated to me was a pile of aviation wireless news magazines, which was this magazine about the newfangled field of aviation and also the newfangled field of radio. These are some very old magazines from the early 1920s. One of the things that 
people I think are most excited about is we have a complete archive of 73 magazine, which you can read online or even download the PDFs of those. Before he died, Wayne Green donated his entire collection of 73 magazines to the archive, and they're all scanned and online. So that's pretty cool. We also have club newsletters from around the world. Ham Radio Clubs have said that we can archive their, their stuff. So we have material from you know, many ham radio clubs in the United States, but also ones in the United Kingdom, a ham radio club in Malta, news bulletins from the South African Radio League. As you know, it's a worldwide hobby, and I'm trying to get representation of what people are doing through their newsletters from around the world. If people have newsletters that are already in digital format, it's fine. I can take the PDFs and get them online. That's super easy. And a few clubs I've talked to they have their newsletters you know, sitting in file cabinets on paper because they were made in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and they've never been scanned. In that case, Internet Archive can take those. We can borrow them. We can scan it all at no cost to your club and make the scans available at the online library. This has been a brief look at the Digital Library of Amateur Communications, DLARC, with K7, K6, KJN, the Internet Archive's Special Collections Director. To see what's in the library as of now, visit archive.org slash details slash D-L-A-R-C. K says it's growing, and it's not as organized as it will be. K is mainly focusing on gathering content at this point. Very 73 from Kent Peterson, KC0 DGY. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has filed his AMSAT report for this week, and as we have mentioned, CAS-5A recently as one of the newest amateur satellites. It has now been issued the official Oscar number. It is known as Fentai Oscar 118, or FO 118. Congratulations to the Chinese amateur radio group CAMSAT for their efforts in having this satellite designed, built, tested, and it is operational. They worked with local education authorities and students from 10 high schools. One of the more unique features of the satellite is that it has a VU linear transponder as well as a VU FM repeater. A lot of fun, whichever method you prefer, maybe both. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that heightened sunspot activity over the past week no doubt produced the great conditions during last weekend's ARRL 10-meter contest. Compared to the previous seven days, the average daily sunspot numbers jumped from 85 to 136.9, while solar flux averages increased from 137.5 to 150. Geomagnetic indicators were lower, with the planetary A index decreasing from 14.4 to 7.7, .7, and the middle latitude A index decreasing from 9.1 to 6. Higher sunspot numbers and lower geomagnetic indicators are an ideal combination for favorable HF propagation. New sunspots appeared every day except for December 12th, with one new sunspot on December 8th, another on the 9th, three more on December 10th, another on December 13th, and one more on December 14th. So let's take a look at the latest prediction from the United States Air Force via the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who shows solar flux predictions at 162, 160, 158, 154, 152, and 150 on December 17th through the 22nd, then 120 on December 23rd through the 28th, then 125, 130, and 135 on December 29th through the 31st, and 145 on January 1st through the 8th. Taking a quick look at the predicted planetary A indice, it will be 5 on December 17th, 10 on December 18th, 8 on December 19th through the 20th, then 12, 8, and 15 on December 21st through the 23rd. It'll be 20 on December 24th through the 28th, and then 12, 10, 12, 8, 5, and 18 on December 29th, all the way through January 3rd, 2023. Radio Sport Contesting on December 15th and 16th. It's the Walk for the Bacon QRP Contest. That is CW. On the 16th, a couple of opportunities for December. The AGB Party Contest, CW Phone and Digital. And the Russian 160 Meter Contest. That is CW and Phone. On the 17th, a lot of opportunities. The Feldhell Sprint. That's Digital. The OKDX Ritty Contest. That's also Digital. 
the RAC Winter Contest, CW and Phone. And on December 17th and 18th, the Croatian CW Contest, that is CW. Also on December 17th and 18th, the Stu Perry Top Band Challenge, that's CW. And on December 18th, the ARRL Ricky Roundup, that is CW as well. And some upcoming section, state, and division conventions for 2023. On January 7th, it's the Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. And on January 27th through the 28th, the Capital City Ham Fest 2023 hosting the ARRL Mississippi State Convention. That is in Jackson, Mississippi. The journey of discovery that comes with hiking across Romania's Via Transylvanica is an adventure for hikers, cyclists, and horseback riders. It got underway on the 8th of October with the official opening of the 1,400-kilometer trail, which had taken four years of construction and special preparation. The journey, which marks the trail's inauguration, is also one for amateur radio operators. Radio Club YO6KGS is activating special event station YR1400VT on the HF bands from now until June 30th, 2023. It's a celebration of the long-distance trail that Romania sees as its counterpart to the Appalachian Trail in the United States and El Camino in Santiago, in Europe. While hikers hope to gain insights into their own lives in a natural setting, amateur radio operators and shortwave listeners around the world can work towards diplomas at different levels according to the number of contacts with other operators many of whom will be young amateurs and members of the YO6KGS School Radio Club. Listen for their call sign on SSB and CW. Of special note is CW speeds will not exceed 14 words per minute. For details about the rules and awards, visit the qrz.com page for YR1400VT. Few of us need reminders that the Bouvet Island de-expeditioners will be activating 3Y0J. From the remote island setting there, we'll be setting sail in less than a month. The 22-day on-air operation will be being led by Ken, LA-7-GIA, Rune, LA-7-THA, and Irwan, LB-1-Q1, and the 12-member team is being motivated to log more than 200,000 QSOs. With Bouvet in the number two spot on the DXCC most wanted list, this is not an impossible goal. While others have activated Bouvet over the years, None have approached the logging that many contacts. The team is committed to reaching its goal. If you visit the D-Expedition website at 3y0.n0, you'll find a propagation poll under the tab labeled Latest News. This will enable interested D-Expedition chasers to provide the team with details about their station setup, including power and antenna, so the operators can approximate propagation to a certain region based on the stations calling them from there. Applications are now being accepted for campers interested in attending Youth on the Air Camp 2023. With more details on the upcoming Youth Camp, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. Licensed amateur radio operators ages 15 through 25 are encouraged to apply online at youthontheair.org. The Radio Amateurs of Canada will be the local host for the 2023 Yoda Camp. It's scheduled to take place July 16th through the 21st, 2023 at the Carleton University campus in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Applications will be accepted through May 31st, 2023, but for the best chance at being selected, applications should be submitted by 2359 Universal Coordinated Time on January 15th, 2023. The application process is free. However, a $100 deposit is required upon acceptance. If a camper is unable to pay the deposit, they may be able to apply for a scholarship or a waiver. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, said campers are responsible for their transportation to the camp location some assistance may be available, and travel during the camp events is provided. A YouTube video is now available about the 2023 Yoda Camp. For details and additional information, contact Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Campers will be selected by the working group and notified by February 1st. To encourage attendance from across the Americas, Allocations for campers are being held open for various areas of North, Central, and South America. 
If countries do not use their allocation, or should someone with an allocation decline acceptance, those positions will be filled from the remaining pool of applicants. As this will be an ongoing process, everyone will not receive notification of acceptance at the same time. Preference will be given to first-time attendees. COVID-19 guidelines are still in effect and may have an impact on offering the camp. Currently, the outlook on offering the camp in July 2023 is positive. If the camp cannot be hosted or would need to be rescheduled, all applicants will be notified as soon as possible. Appropriate requirements on masking and vaccination statuses will be announced as needed. A YouTube video is now available about the 2023 Youth on the Air Camp. For details and additional information, contact the camp director, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair.org. That email address again, director at youthontheair.org. Colonel Jerry Wellman, W7SAR, former ARRL Utah Section Emergency Coordinator, was recently named the National Volunteer Emergency Manager of the Year, the highest honor given to a volunteer emergency manager by the International Association of Emergency Managers. Wellman served as the Utah Wing Civil Air Patrol Commander from September 2009 to May 2013. He served as the Emergency Services Training Officer for the Salt Lake Senior Squadron and currently serves as the Phoenix Cadet Squadron's Assistant Officer for Communication and for Education and Training. At the award ceremony on November 14, 2022, Wellman was cited for being active in enhancing his own emergency management professional development while relentlessly contributing to his community. He taught emergency management communications classes in Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, and chaired the Kearns, Utah Metro Township Emergency Planning Commission. He also served on the Utah State Emergency Response Team and volunteered in the State Emergency Operations Center, contributing more than 150 days during the COVID-19 response and during floods, fires, and winter storms. He also served as an Air Operations Coordinator on three search and rescue missions. Wellman was licensed in 1972 and holds an Amateur Extra Class license. He is an ARRL Life member and a Life member of REACT International. A children's game of hide-and-seek at a railway station went very wrong in August of 2020 when a five-year-old girl chose an unfortunate spot to hide from her three brothers, a train that pulled out of the station shortly afterwards. She was eventually able to disembark further down the line at the Kolkata railway station, but because she spoke only Hindi and not Bengali, she could only explain her situation with her tears when police found her crying at the station. According to a report in the Millennium Post, a year passed in which the girl was sent by an NGO to a children's care home and enrolled in school. She gained fluency in Bengali and soon became an honor student in her class. Unable to track down her parents all this time, the administrators of the private home notified the West Bengal Radio Club of the girl's predicament, according to Ambarish Nag Biswas, VU2JFA. Club members utilized their network of contacts and were able to trace her family to Jharkhand, a bordering state in eastern India. Photographs shared with the family on the WhatsApp mobile platform confirmed that this was indeed their missing daughter. The little girl went home on Saturday, December 10th. Ambarish Nagbiswas told the Indo-Asian News Service, when our contacts got in touch with the mother and we got her to connect with her daughter through a video call, it was a heart-wrenching moment. The woman had given up her child as dead. The little girl had given up all hope of getting back to her family ever again. On December 9, 2022, the CAS 5A satellite was launched on a Smart Dragon 3 Y1 launch vehicle from the Chinese Sea launch platform in the Yellow Sea. The Chinese amateur satellite group CAMSAT, working closely with local education authorities, designed, built, tested, and managed the CAS 5A satellite. 31 students from 10 high schools learned satellite design, 
manufacturing, and applications through educational courses initiated by CampSat and the Fengtai Educational Institution. The satellite carries VU and HU linear transponders, a VU FM repeater, and CW and GMSK telemetry beacons for amateur radio use. At the request of CAMSAT and the CAS 5A team, AMSAT hereby designates the satellite as Fengte Oscar 118 or FO 118. We congratulate all the involved teams, thank them for their contribution to the amateur satellite community, and wish them continued success on this and future projects. Radio Spectrum Management, or RSM, in New Zealand is preparing to say goodbye to two members of its radio investigations team who are among those with the longest tenure. RSM has announced the retirement of Mike Baird and Grant Wheaton, who have both been part of the team since the early 1970s. RSM said that the pair's efforts have played a big role over the years in strengthening processes and technical abilities of the investigations groups. In addition to following up on reports of radio frequency interference, RSM manages the radio spectrum in New Zealand, handles licensing rules, and oversees compliance and enforcement of the Radio Communication Act of 1989. It is part of the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This past winter, I took a very nice three-day trip on a long-distance train and brought along two HTs, one of which could do APRS, so hams I knew were able to track some of my progress online as we crossed the western United States. The long-distance passenger trains in the western U.S. travel through some very remote areas of the country with no hint of cellular coverage and no FM voice repeaters either, but I was able to get some distant APRS stations and my route could still be tracked by relatives I was going to see in Chicago by watching for me on APRS.FI online. Even in western Texas, near the little town of Marfa, home of the famous Marfa Lights, I could still get APRS coverage. I think the added height of the two-story tall cars used in the western U.S. was a definite plus on signal coverage. Those tall passenger cars put the horizon way far out, much more so than driving in a car. I did give some thought to trying to work some CW on 20 meters during the trip, but trying to transmit QRP on a compromised antenna from within a, a grounded stainless steel car that doubles as a noisemaker on HF I decided not to even bother, but I bet it'd still be possible. I'd like to hear from anyone who has been successful working HF from inside a sleeper car. On my tiny handheld HT, I put one band on whatever channel the crew was using and the other band on 146.52 simplex and was surprised how much that frequency is used across the western USA, but I could not pin down our train crew to any particular channel. They seemed to change to whatever the nearest rail dispatch was using. Maybe I'm wrong on that. In some parts of the country where we used to have many rail lines stretching as far as you can see, today many of these lines are reduced to a single track or gone altogether. Problems arise with passenger service when a freight train stalls or breaks an airline on a stretch of single track, then nothing gets by and the hours of delay can build and build. Bringing your 2 meter HT can mean you could be the only one on the train that knows why you're sitting by that one tree for two hours not moving an inch. I've had more than one ham tell me they bought one of those cheap China-made HTs and programmed all 100 VHF rail channels and 14652 and brought it along rather than risk losing their $400 HT since the sleeper rooms don't lock if you're not inside them. This sounds like good advice. Each room has a 117 volt AC power outlet so be sure to bring your HT charger and a short outlet strip to power things like your laptop and your GPS too. In parts of the western U.S. rail network with decent cellular coverage, I saw several younger people playing online shooter games on laptop computers seated at empty dining tables up in the observation car where the cellular coverage must be better and there are plenty of 117 volt outlets. One young boy was playing a live action shooter game, wearing a headset and talking to his teammates around the world from a seat inside the observation car, talking in a full outdoor voice, perhaps unaware that he could be heard over the entire car and nobody could carry on a conversation within 10 feet of him and his mom was sitting right next to him and never tried to quiet him down. The main lesson to be learned here is that the only means of communication on the rails today that always works is VHF two-way radio. Next time you're thinking of taking a trip, why not consider including ham radio and take the train instead of the plane and all the hassles at the airport and those tiny uncomfortable seats. 
This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This year, Data VU2DSI was not the only amateur activating a special event station in late November to mark the birth of the pioneering Indian scientist Jagdish Chandra Bose. Dada has operated his special event AU2JCB for 17 years. This year, Parks and On Air India has organized their own separate tribute using the call sign AT8JCB. It was a POTA activation as well, operating from the Manjapur Forest Park in West Bengal, India. POTA number VU-0136, Parks on the Air India, is a relatively new program. It began barely a year ago, but according to the POTA country administrator, Aruvnia Day, VU3XRY, the team of its operators made up for the lost time and with a Bose tribute. He said the response was nothing short of huge and a great success. Aronava went on the air to say over the course of the eight-day activation, AT8JCB, logged more than 900 QSOs. With QSL and EQSL cards being sent in mid-December to their various destinations, Parks on the Air India has other activities in store for the rest of the month. There will also be more than 4,000 parks to be activated on the list of qualifying POTA locations. The man was called by many to be the father of radio communications would no doubt be proud of all the amateur radio activity these days in India. And bringing our newscast to a close this week is this story. On Thursday, November 24th, 2022, Thanksgiving evening, Montana Public Broadcasting aired a documentary about amateur radio that was appropriately titled, Ham. The 25-minute program was produced by students in cooperation with the Greater Montana Foundation, as well as the School of Journalism and the School of Visual and Media Arts at the University of Montana in Missoula. Several local amateur radio operators were featured in the program, including Lance Collister, W7GJ, Dennis Lane, KR7Q, Mike Leary, K7MSO, and Keith Graves, NE7R. Together, they talked about how amateur radio has evolved and their experiences as active hams. The program is available to watch on the Montana PBS website at www.montanapbs.org forward slash programs forward slash ham. That address again, www.montanapbs.org forward slash programs forward slash ham. I was happy to agree to the interview, said AWRL member Dennis Lane, KR7Q, who was among a handful of hams featured in the video, such as Lane and his wife Debbie, Lance Collister, W7GJ, Karen Orzik, Mike Leary, K7MSO, Keith Graves, NE7R, and Lois Graves, W7LAG. The students visited my home in Hamshack in early March of 2022. They seemed to be interested in the human interest aspect of ham radio, Lane continued. I try to emphasize the relationships and lifelong friendships that I've enjoyed over my 45 years in the hobby. Lane also shared, When I told the students about Parks on the Air, they asked if they could come with me on my next Parks on the Air activation. I was happy to have them join me at Lee Metcalf National Wildlife Refuge in Stevensville. During the activation, Lane made radio contacts on both VHF and shortwave using an NFED half-wave antenna. One of the first contacts I made was in Alaska. They seemed very excited about that. The University of Montana student film crew included Grace Walcott, Cal Bailey, Jared Bang, Carter Bernhardt, Julian Doucette, Maya Fleck, Marsha Haight, Natalie Verplogen, and Ryan Weibush. Lane published these personal videos from behind the scenes of the making of the film. They are available on YouTube. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. 
Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Electron Binders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs This Week in Amateur Radio every week on club-owned KOKTLP 90.9. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing...